Hi, I'm Herb Gross, and welcome to lecture number 16 in Gateways to Algebra, where today we'll do the second half of looking at linear equations. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to accomplish in this session. Uh, one is to simply point out that life isn't always as simple as being given the mx plus b form directly, but rather, shall we say, implicitly. In other words, it's not in the form that we want, but by using the rules of the game, so to speak, the rules that make algebra the game that we talked about. Uh, we can reduce the unfamiliar problem again to a more familiar problem that we've already solved. So for example, suppose the equation we were given, well, we'll just read it. It's five brackets, two times parentheses x plus three, close parentheses, plus four, close brackets, equals nine x plus 60. Well, see, here we notice right away that the right-hand side of the equation has the mx plus b form. In other words, in this particular case, 9 is playing the role of m, and 60 is playing the role of b. The problem is the left-hand side isn't quite in that form yet. However, we do know how to read this. This says what? We go into the most innermost grouping symbols first. This says what? Start with x, add 3, multiply by 2, add 4, then multiply by 5. So let's undo this. In other words, uh, the x is inside the parentheses, what's the first thing that's operating on the parentheses? You see, there's a plus 4, there's also multiplying by 2, and since multiplication is done before addition by a convention, when there are no grouping symbols, it says first multiply by 2, so by a distributive property, this becomes 2 times x, which is 2x, plus 2 times 3, which is 6. Okay? Technically speaking, that's now all within these grouping symbols, but again, since addition has the commutative and associative properties, we can regroup this to add the 6 and the 4 separately and wind up with what? 2x plus 10. Now, what's happening to the 2x plus 10? It's being multiplied by the 5. So the 5 multiplies the, 10x, the 2x to give us 10x. The 5 also multiplies the 10 to give us 50. And so now what's happened is by using the rules of the game, we have transformed this unfamiliar form into a form that we've seen before. And what did we see before in this form? When the x's occur on both sides, we look at the smaller number of x's and subtract that from both sides of the equation. That's now become a standard strategy in what we're doing. Since 9 is less than 10, we subtract 9x from both sides. Okay? Now, how can we do this? If we subtract 9x from both sides, 9x from 10x leaves me with 1x, which is x. So we have x plus 50 on this side. Subtracting 9x from here cancels out the 9x and leaves me just with 60. Now to get the x by itself, I notice that I have to get rid of the 50. Since the 50 is being added to the x, to undo that I subtract it. But if I subtract 50 from one side, which gives me x on this side, I also have to subtract 50 from the other side, and 50 from uh, 60 leaves me with 10, so x must be 10. And by the way, we can check this out to see if it works. Suppose, and, and this is what's nice about math, if you say, hey, there's no answers in the back of the book, it doesn't matter. If this is right, what should happen? If I replace x by 10 here and here, I should get the same answer on both sides. Let's see what happens here. 10 plus 3 is 13. 13 times 2 is 26. 26 plus 4 is, 26 plus 4 is 30. 30 times 5 is 150. On this side, 10 times 9 is 90, plus 60 is 150. And therefore, this is a true statement when x is 10, in which case both of these expressions are 150. And again, to help you remember what we've been doing, you, if algebra bothers you and you still can't do that, I, I want you to learn the algebra, but don't ever use the fact that you can't do algebra as an excuse not to be able to solve the problem. Because one thing that always works, if you can read what these symbols mean, is trial and error. In other words, let's take a look and see what's happening over here. Let's translate these into words. See, this says what? Start with x, multiply by 9, add 60. This says what? Start with x, add 3, multiply by 2, add 4, and multiply by 5. So let me just call those programs number 1 and programs number 2. See, program number 1 says what? Instead of saying start with x, we say input x, add 3, multiply by 2, add 4, multiply by 5, output y, okay? Program number 2 says input x, multiply by 9, and add 60. Now, these are both quite different programs. Let's see how. 
For example, suppose I make 2 the input of program number 1. I start with 2. I add 3. That gives me 5. I multiply by 2. That gives me 10. I add 4. gives me 14. I multiply by 5. That gives me 70. So if the input is 2, the output is 70. Let's see how that works here. If the input is 2, I multiply by 9. That gives me 18. Okay. I add 60. That gives me 78. So the output would be 78. Therefore, was 2 a right answer to this problem? If 2 had been a right answer, the output would have been the same in both cases. However, since 70 is not the se same as 78, it means I guess wrong. But the guess is not wasted. Notice that by guessing 2, program number 1 gave me an answer that was smaller than the answer I got to program number 2. So what I'm going to try to do is to pick a, a bigger number and see what happens. I'm going to try 15 this time. Why 15? I had to pick something. I just happened to pick 15. Okay, 15, I add 3, gives me 18. Multiply by 2 gives me 36. Add 4 gives me 40. Multiply by 5 gives me 200. What happens if I start with 15 over here? I multiply by 9. That gives me 135. I add 60. That gives me 195. So now I did what? Did I guess right again? No, I guessed wrong again. Because here the output was 200, but here the output was 195. Well, it's funny. I guessed wrong twice, but they were very, very clever wrong guesses. Why? Because the first guess made the answer to program number one smaller than the answer to program two. The second guess made the wrong answer bigger in program one than it was in program two. As I'll show you in a minute or two, it means that some place in between must be the right answer. In other words, some place between an input of two and an output of 15, there must be the right answer. So going back to what we've already shown, uh, I sooner or later, by trial and error, would have stumbled across 10. And if I did that, can we check that 10 is the right answer? Yeah, we already had done that, but let's just check it again. You start with 10, okay, you add 3 gives you 13, multiply by 2 gives you 26, add 4 gives you 30, multiply by 5 gives you 150. Start with 10 over here, you multiply by 9 gives you 90, add 60 gives you 150, and not only is this the right answer, but by algebra we've shown that it's the only possible right answer because what we've shown is that the only time these two outputs can be the same. Remember what we started with. Let me see if I have the, uh, we won't bother writing the equations all over again, but what we showed was the only value of x that would make this a true statement. And if we now translate this ge uh, geometrically into a picture, we get a pretty nice result over here. Okay, what I've done is, is I'm going to graph y equals 9x plus 60, and I'm going to graph this more complicated thing that we showed was 10x plus 50, and basically what does this say? To, to graph this one, I'm, not gonna, I'm obviously not going to use the same scale on both axes here because the picture would go, I, I would need much too large a piece of paper to do this, but basically what do I know over here? I know that when x is 0, when x is 0, y is 50. I also know what? When, I can just pick a number at random, when x is 3, when x is 3, y will be 80. So I can plot this point, this point, and two points determine a straight line. But to play it safe, I also know what? When x is 50, I'm, when x is 5, 10 times 5 is 50, plus 50 is 100. It's always good when you know something's going to be a straight line to graph more than two points. And the reason is, if you graph two points incorrectly, any two points determine a straight line. But if you, if you graph three or more points incorrectly, the chances are they won't all lie on the same straight line. In other words, if this is supposed to be a straight line and you get a graph like this, it tells you that you've made a mistake someplace. So it's always good to graph more than two points. But the thing I want you to see is if you can pick up this distinction, and uh, this is another reason why graphical solutions aren't always the best. Do you notice how close in direction these two lines are? So when they come together up here, there's a whole gray area in here where a small, small mistake in drawing this line in the right direction can shift where these two lines come together. So that's a, something I want to address in a later lecture. But for the time being, can you see what's happened over here? You see, our first guess, when, when we guessed two, you see what happened? The black curve was, the black straight line was beneath the red one. And so what that meant was, that was the, this is the geometric version of what it meant to say that the output from program one 
was less than the output from program two. When we tried 15, what happened now was that the two, cur the two straight lines had already crossed. Notice that up to the point of intersection, the red line is on the top, the black line is on the bottom, but after that one point of intersection, the two curves interchange positions. So whenever you, whenever you guess wrong, but you reverse the inequality, you've come to uh, an indication that says what? The lines must have crossed, and so we know that the answer has to be someplace in between where the red line was on top and then later it was on the bottom. Now, okay, so do you follow the idea here? Basically what we do is, when we don't have the mx plus b form, we use the rules of our game so that we can transform what we have into the mx plus b form. The other problems that I wanted to discuss today is that even after you get the mx plus b form, some mighty strange things can happen. And I'm going to try to illustrate that with the next problem that's going to look very, very similar to the problem that we did before, but it's going to be just different enough to have caused a problem. In fact, what I'm going to do is to take the same left-hand side of the equation that we had before and make the right-hand side a little bit more complicated. See, here's a case where neither side directly has the mx plus b form, but because of what I know about the rules of the game, I can transform both of these into the mx plus b form. I'm not going to do this one all over again because we've already gone through these steps. Well, what the heck, it's not that long, let's just review it. The 2 multiplies the x plus the 3 to give me 2x plus 6. I add the 4 and the 6 to get 10. That leaves the left-hand side as 10x uh, plus 50. I'm just going to leave that for now. That's what this side here reduces to. Okay. Now, what happens up here? The 2 multiplies what's in the parentheses. So by a distributive property, the 2 times the 5x gives me 10x. The 2 times the 12 gives me 24. The 24 and the 26 add up to 50. And again, even though I hope you don't need this reminder, let me give it to you again, you cannot add the 10 and the 50 to get 60. Well, I guess physically you can add them, it's just not right. Because the 10 is modifying the x and the 50 isn't. Remember, the only time 10 plus 50 will be 60 is when the 10 and the 50 and the 60 all modify the same amount. Okay? Now, what's the next step? We're going to subtract the smaller number of x's from both sides, but in this problem, the smaller number happens to be the same. It's both 10. So let's subtract 10x from both sides, and what happens? We wind up with 50 equals 50. And let's just keep on going this way. Subtract 50 from both sides. We wind up with what? 0 equals 0. Now, for what value of x will 0 equal 0? This is very tricky. Be careful. Don't confuse this with x plus 0 equals 0. See, the only time x plus 0 can equal 0 is if x itself is 0. When will 0 equal 0? Zero? 0 is always equal to 0. It's like saying, for what value of x will there be 7 days in a the week? There's always 7 days in a week. You see, what happened over here is, look, this says what? Pick a number, multiply by 10, and add 50. What does this say? Pick a number, multiply by 10, and add 50. Isn't this exactly the same set of instructions? In other words, this and this are disguised ways of saying what? They're two different ways of saying what? The same thing. In fact, what do they say? Pick a number, multiply by 10, and add 50. And how do you know they say the same thing? Because when you try to solve this algebraically, look what happens. The variable disappears. And all you have is a statement with numbers in it, and that statement is either true or false. It can't be both. So let me give you another example. Suppose I say for what value of x? Is it true that there are x days in a week? Well, since there are seven days in a week, x has to stand for seven. But if I say to you, for what value of x will there be seven days in a week, it doesn't matter what the value of x is, there's still going to be what? Seven days in a week. When I say to you, for what value of x will zero equal zero, any value of x zero will equal zero. That's a true statement. There's no variable in there. So what this says in terms of a picture is this. If I translate the left-hand side of the equation into words, it says what? Input x, add 3, multiply by 2, add 4, multiply by 5, and the output will be y. The second, the right-hand side of the equation said, input x, multiply by 5, add 12, multiply by 2, add 26, and the output will be y. 
And what we showed by the algebra was that both of these two programs, both of them, can be paraphrased into what simpler pro program? The multiply by 10, add 50 program. In other words, if you say, pick a number, multiply by 10, add 50, and write the answer, if you put the same input here, here, and here, the output will be the same in all three cases. And in fact, what this says is what? This is a simpler paraphrase of both of these two programs. And what it means in terms of graphing is that if I were to graph the top relationship, in other words, now how do you graph? You find a net, you pick a value of x, find the corresponding value of y, okay? That locates a point for you. Then you pick another value of x another, and, co and compute what the value of y would be. That gives you another point that determines a line. What I'm saying is if three different people were assigned to each draw one of these graphs on the same piece of graph paper, when they got all through, what would happen? This would turn out to be what? Three different ways of expressing the same relationship. By the way, that doesn't just happen in math. That happens in everything when things are synonyms. For example, who wrote Huckleberry Finn? That was Mark Twain, wasn't it? Mark Twain wasn't the man's real name. His real name was what? Samuel Clemens. Now, Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens are two completely different names. If I say to somebody, how many syllables are there in Samuel Clemens? I expect the answer to be five, right? Samuel Clemens. I don't want the person to say two because Samuel Clemens is the same as Mark Twain and Mark Twain has only two syllables. You see, Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain are not the same, are not the same names, are they? But do they name the same person? Yes, and therefore, any question to which the person Mark Twain is the right answer, the person Samuel Clemens will also be the right answer. But if the words Mark Twain are the right answer, Samuel Clemens may be wrong. And, uh, and see, all I want you to see in this particular situation is that sometimes in mathematics, we have different names for the same quantity. And whenever we can show that those different names name the same expression, we are then free to pick the simpler of those relationships to be the generic form. In other words, we don't, if we can replace a whole bunch of complicated things by simpler but equivalent things, uh, that makes life a lot simpler and also a, less, a, a lot less chance for making mistakes. In other words, if I, if I can take a complicated piece of machinery apart and put it together with fewer pieces, okay, fewer parts, and it still works the same way, isn't the maintenance much easier? Because I don't, have to, I don't have to check as much. The more steps you have in a math problem, even with a calculator, the greater the mistake there is that you're going to transfer a piece of information incorrectly. So form is, means a lot in this stuff. Now, the other problem is the reverse can happen. Here's one that you may find interesting. Here's one, it starts off with the same left-hand side, but the right-hand side is now 10x plus 60. I hope you noticed that we knew before that this side here was going to be 10x plus 50. There's, a little, there's an interesting situation that happens here that I want to make sure that we all understand. Let's go and see, if we went through the steps here simplifying, the left-hand side here would come out to be what? 10x plus 50. What would the right-hand side be? It's already in the mx plus b form. It's already 10x plus 60. Now we go ahead naively trying to solve this problem. What do I mean by naively? Just using the rules that we've been taught. We now subtract 10x from both sides, you see, we can get rid of the 10x on one side by subtracting it. The trouble is, since 10x is on both sides, we get rid of all the x's by subtracting 10x from both sides. Now we're left with what? 50 equals 60, which, by the way, should already tell you that this is an impossible statement. See, for what value of x is 50 the same as 60? There is none. 50 is never equal to 60. Again, don't confuse that with the person who says, for what value of x? Will x plus 50 equal 60? You see, that's an equation in which the variable appears, and the only time that's going to be true is when x is 10. But notice over here, there is no variable to take up the slack. See, in other words, you could look at this as being 0x plus 50, and no, mo no matter what value you pick for x, this is still going to come out to be 50, and this value is going to be what? 60. This is never a true statement. But to make it more glaring, subtract 50 from both sides, and you now have what? 0 equals 10, which can never be true. See, this statement is never true. Now, it, this statement is not only never true, but the fact that you wound up with 0 equals 10 tells you something very special. What's really true is what? 
that 10 is more than zero. That part we do know. What this is a clue to tell you is that somehow in what we've written over here, the left-hand side is always going to be what? 10 less. See 10, le see, 10 is what? 10 more than zero? Look what's happening over here if you have a mathematical sense. This says what? Start with a number, multiply by 10. Well, isn't that the same thing you're doing here? Start with a number, multiply by 10. What are you doing here? Whatever the output is, add 50. What are you doing here? Whatever the output is, add 60. Well, if you start with a number and multiply by 10 in both places, the output's the same so far. So if on one side you add 50, on the other side you add 60, isn't the side that has the 60 going to always be 10 more than the side that had the 50? The beauty of the algebra is if you don't have that kind of insight, the algebra does it for you. What this algebraic statement says is, look, the left-hand side is never equal to the right-hand side. Moreover, for any given value of x, the right-hand side is going to be what? 10 more than the left-hand side. And if you want to see what that means in terms of a graph, you see the 10 is still what we call the slope. That's still the m. That tells you how fast the line is rising. Aren't the two lines rising at the same rate over here? This says what? Every time x increases by 1, the y value, the output, increases by 10 because 10 is multiplying the input. If the input increases by 1, then the output increases by 10 times that 1, which is 10. So again, not graphing this to scale, but simply showing you what's happening over here. If you graph the lines y equal 10x plus 60, which I've done in red, and the other side of the equation, the left-hand side, uh, which I've done in black, but which translates into 10x plus 50, both of these lines have the same slope. That means they are parallel lines. What's the big difference? When x is 0 for the red line, y is 60. But when x is 0, y is only 50. And what happens is it starts with a difference of what? A vertical difference of 10 between these. And these two lines now do what? Move on a parallel track, never to meet again. You see, when you have two straight lines, what are the possibilities? They can either have different slopes, in which case they'll meet in one and only one place. Or they can have what? The same slope, in which case the two lines have the same direction. If they have the same direction and they're not the same line, then they have no solutions in common because the lines never meet. And if it's just two different forms of expressing the same line, then every value of x will give you the same value of y in both of these because they'll in reality be what? The same line. So in summary, what we're saying is what? A linear equation must have, and this is interesting, one of these three things has to happen. There'll be exactly one solution, meaning one x value that will make both linear expressions equal, or there'll be none, or else every single number will be a solution. Now that really depends heavily on being linear. You see, not every relationship is linear. I think we talked about this in the Nilia lecture, but I think it's important to repeat. See, basically linear means what? That the, that the thing always changes at the same rate. See, if life were linear, if your height doubled, okay, if your height increased by two feet in one year, it would increase by two feet every year. See, linear means what? The same change in input, a unit change in the input, always produces the same change in the output. So a linear relationship graphs as a straight line. Most relationships in the real world are not straight lines. You see, I think I may have explained that to you before. You see, uh, the reason that calculus is such an important subject, it, it, I think it's obvious from the way I drew this that this is not a straight line relationship. As badly as I draw, I think you can all see that this is not a straight line. Uh, what the subject calculus does is kind of interesting. What calculus does is it says, look, if I come near any point on a non-straight line, any point at all, and draw what we call a tangent line, in other words, a line that just touches that curve, do you notice that for a fairly large interval, you cannot distinguish between the curve itself and the tangent line? And all calculus really says is that life is locally linear, that at any point in this curve, if I draw the tangent line near that point of tangency, the, the straight line itself looks like that curve. But the important thing is what? Globally, see what I'm saying? In other words, even though a straight line will always approximate this curve near a given point, as I move from point to point, the shape, the direction of that straight line varies dramatically. So if I look at this thing as a whole, notice what I find over here. What I find is uh, that the thing doesn't look at all like a straight line. Now suppose 
this was the graph of some relationship. In other words, suppose this was the picture of a particular relationship. And in fact, in the next lecture, I'm going to introduce some new terminology that's called graphs and functions. It's fancy names that come up in the literature all the time, and we might as well come to grips with that. But what I want you to see for now is that when, when one of the relationships is not linear, there's no reason why there only has to be one solution or none or infinitely many. Here's a relationship that graphs like this. Here's a linear relationship. And can you see that there are what? See, this arrow means that the curve will never come back ag again this way. This means it will never come back this way. Can you see that this straight line intersects this curve in three places? That was his a case where there are three solutions. If this curve were to double back again, could there be four solutions? See, in other words, here's what you have to be careful about. If you see some data points, see, don't all these points look like they're on the same straight line? Now, if you knew that this graph had to be a straight line, you would be in pretty good shape that way. But the problem is what? What if the curve looked like this? See, aren't these four points on this curve? And yet, if you took the straight line that joins those points, you don't get a very good representation that way. OK? So let's just summarize to finish up now. When you're dealing with linear equations, only one of three things can happen. And I'll, I'll just show you a picture that we'll end on so that you can see what's going to happen. See, one type of a linear equation is there'll only be one solution. And how do you recognize there's going to be one solution? Because in the mx plus b form, the multiplier of x on this side is not the same as the multiplier of x on this side. That means the lines have different slopes. That means different directions. They're going to intersect. Here's a case where, what? The lines are going to have the same slope because 2x plus 1x is 3x. 1 plus 6 is 7. And the trouble is what? 3x plus 7 is always equal to 3x plus 7. So this is what? A relationship that looks like there's only going to be one answer, but every value of x works because this is only what? The same different ways of writing the same expression. And finally, here's one for which there'll never be a solution because what? Adding 3 onto a number will never give you the same result as if you added 4 onto the same number. So you have the first case, which is called a conditional equality. In other words, this is true on the condition that x is 4. This is an identity. It's true no matter what x is. And this is called an inconsistency because it's never true no matter what x is. At any rate, I guess this is a good place to stop to say study hard, have fun, stay young. See you next time.